Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our second session for this advanced training on pre and post fire monitoring. My name is Amber McCollum, and I'm joined by my colleague Juan Torres Perez. We are also really grateful to have two colleagues from NASA's develop program who will be joining us for our Q and a for um, the Google Earth engine for part two. So we have Brittany Boudry and Haley Pippin um, joining us today. So we're really grateful to have them as well. Just a little overview of the logistics uh, for this training. We have two sessions. We had our first session on Tuesday and our second session today. Um, each of these sessions, if you were with us last time, um, contain a lecture, a hands-on exercise, a question and answer session, and some lab time where we will remain online to um, help you with questions as you have them, as you work through the exercises of this training. You can find all the course materials on the website listed here, including the exercise documents um, for the last session. And then for the uh, exercises for this session, they are actually just Google Earth Engine code, and we have links to those later on in the lecture. There are two prerequisites for this training. First, you need to have an understanding of the basics of remote sensing, and we've linked our fundamentals of remote sensing training here. And then second, we had this really great um, fires training this last summer where we looked at pre, during, and post fire activity. And um, it's a really great background to some of the um, pieces that we'll dive into a little more deeply here. I will say that some of the slides from this session are an overview from, from that um, training, but we'll definitely go in more depth here. And I wanna encourage everyone to ask questions along the way as we go through this lecture. You can type them into the Q&A and we'll try to get to them at the end. If for some reason we don't get to your question, you can always email myself or my colleague, Juan Torres Perez here. Um, and then also as a reminder, we do uh, catalog all of the questions and the answers to those questions and post them on our website. Um, at a later date. So give us about a week or so to get those organized and then you can check back and have those answers for reference. For this series, we have one homework assignment and um, the link to the homework is available now. So you can go to the training website and um, access the homework there. It's a Google form and you can submit all of your answers on that Google form. Um, the homework does contain questions from last session as well as this session, so just keep that in mind. Um, once you've completed that, and if you attended both of our live webinars, you um, can receive a certificate of completion, and those will be emailed to you within about three months. Um, this does take a while because we have such a large group, so do give us time to get those um, certificates out to you. As I mentioned, the series has two sessions. We talked about pre-fire monitoring in particular climate conditions and landscape conditions um, that influence fire ignition and spread. And then today's session, we're really gonna focus on that post-fire mapping and monitoring. For this training series, uh, these are the objectives. By the end of the training, you should be able to identify land cover and climate variables related to wildfire risks. So that's what we talked about um, last session and be able to access and display uh, wildfire risk data layers. And then today, um, you'll, you should be able to create a burn severity map using satellite imagery as, as well as calculate burn area statistics. And we'll be doing those hands-on activities in Google Earth Engine. And so given that, I want to remind you all um, that you need to sign up for an Earth Engine account um, if you haven't done so already. We've provided the link here. It's free. Um, you don't need a Gmail um, address. Um, that's something that has recently changed. Um, and hopefully you um, saw the instructions for this ahead of time. But if you have not signed up, Google Earth Engine account, no worries. You can do this later and you can always come back to our code um, at a later date and work through that. 
So as we discussed last session, we have two case studies that we're focusing on to provide examples of pre and post fires. Um, the first example is the, the Lytton um, Creek fires that broke out in Canada this past summer during that really um, intense heat wave. And then we're also focusing on um, a massive outbreak of fires in Bolivia in 2020. Um, and then the hands-on exercises will focus on both of these. So we have um, today we have two hands-on exercises in Earth Engine, one for Canada, one for Bolivia. So similarly to how um, the last session went. So here's the agenda for today. Um, first, we're going to review some post-fire assessments. Then we're going to discuss burn area and burn severity mapping. And then we'll mention a few tools for post-fire mapping. And then we're going to talk a little bit about Google Earth Engine for those of you who may not be as familiar with it. Um, some of the benefits um, of using this, this software and how to use it for conducting assessments of remote sensing imagery. And after the lecture portion, we will have time for a Q&A. And then, as I mentioned, we'll stay on for lab time, um, where we may um, be quiet for a while, allow you to work through the, the code, but then maybe come on and um, address any issues that you all are having um, that are very common or um, things like that. So we'll just see how that part of the session goes. OK, so now let's review um, what we take into account when we think about post-fire assessments. As with the first lecture, um, some of these slides are a review of our training that we provided um, last summer. So um, I do encourage you to check that out for more information too. While there is a myriad of post-fire impacts that affect our ecosystems and infrastructure, it's important to remember that they are a natural part of forest, grasslands, and tundra environments. Following a fire, the impacts can include a release of carbon dioxide and soot particles into the atmosphere, thereby influencing climate. Um, we see a change in soil chemistry and a reduction in soil fertility. We often see destruction of vegetation, leading to increased runoff or soil erosion. Um, and it also influences the nutrient cycle and, and the ecosystems and wildlife that are present um, in this region. When we conduct post-fire assessments from a remote sensing perspective, we are usually interested in burn severity, which is a function of fire intensity. Fire intensity is the amount of energy or heat released per unit time or area and can be described by a variety of fire intensity metrics. Traditionally, fire intensity is considered the rate of energy or heat release per unit time per unit length of the fire front, regardless of its depth. Fires of different intensity tend to look very different and have the ability to burn vegetation and soil to different degrees. So it's really important to keep in mind this intensity piece and it's really a major factor in determining the severity of burning. Burn severity is the most mappable metric for post-fire assessment. Burn severity is the effect of a fire on ecosystem properties and is often defined by the degree of vegetation mortality. Usually we think about burn severity as a way to measure the degree to which the site has been altered or disrupted by a fire with severity determined by the fire intensity and the residence time. Soil burn severity is also an important factor in assessment of overall burn severity. Fire-induced changes in physical, chemical, and biological soil properties impact the hydrological and biological functions of the soil. Severely burned soil contains less organic matter, but more available nutrients. Burned soil also makes landscape more vulnerable to erosion and runoff. So we can see large scale um, impacts on the watershed after a fire. So here we have a figure to summarize the effects of fire on the land surface. And this illustrates the effects of fire intensity on above ground vegetation 
as well as on below ground soil properties. You can also see the transition of landscape properties from the during fire stage to the post fire stage. So when we talk about burn severity, we're typically referring to the changes in both vegetation and soil properties. Although with remote sensing, we're really monitoring that vegetation aspect most of the time. So before we dive into the use of satellite sensor data for post-fire assessments, it's really important to mention some of the ground-based methods um, that we attempt to approximate with remote sensing. So having these measurements is always really important to compare with our um, imagery. Field burn severity assessments often complete a composite burn index or CBI. The CBI was developed to assess fire effects on vegetation and soil. CBI plots rate the burn severity for substrates, herbs, low shrubs, small trees, tall trees, intermediate trees, and big trees. So each of these categories are related to um, determine the burn severity. Ratings are then averaged for each category and then across all plots to provide burn severity rating for the entire study area. This index is particularly useful for comparison with satellite derived burn severity. Ground based assessments of vegetation regrowth often look at post fire tree injuries and determine tree mortality over time. After a fire event, some trees are injured rather than completely burned. So these assessments account for mortality over time related to field injury. Field observations of vegetation regrowth can also provide information that we can compare to the um, remote sensing imagery. So from a remote sensing perspective, we usually assess post-fire landscape impacts with two metrics, burned area to determine the spatial extent and location of the burn scars, and then burn severity that we've been talking a lot about here, which is the relative impact of the fire on the landscape. So we'll go over this a little bit more in the following slides, but here you can see an example of burned area and burn severity. With these two metrics, we're able to use remote sensing imagery to assess the extent and magnitude of fire impacts over large areas. We can also assess the landscape long after the fire in order to assess regrowth. In remote sensing assessments of vegetation regrowth, we typically use vegetation indices, like those that we discussed last session, like NDVI, for example, as well as land cover classification methods, which we also discussed last session, um, and the presence and health of vegetation over time. So, um, well, this is not something we'll, we'll cover today in our hands-on exercise. Um, we've talked a lot about the use of vegetation indices, um, and you can use those for post-fire assessments as well. Um, generally, looking at the vegetation regrowth for a year and two years post the fire, we can start to see um, some of this vegetation um, grow back. So um, this is an example from um, central Queensland in Australia, where um, this was actually a coal mine rehabilitation, but it provides um, similar attributes of how long it takes for the vegetation to um, grow back in these regions. Okay, so now let's, let's take a, a deeper dive into burned area and burn severity mapping. First, it's important to understand how optical sensors use spectral information to examine vegetation conditions under typical cir circumstances. So here we have a spectral response curve of vegetation plotted over the electromagnetic spectrum from 0.4 to 2.6 micrometers. In healthy vegetation, there is a relatively high response in the green portion of the spectrum due to chlorophyll pigmentation. And there is also a very high near infrared response due to the uh, healthy plant structure and a relatively low response in the mid-infrared due to water absorption. Um, so this is a typical curve of healthy vegetation. So when we compare that healthy vegetation to those of burned areas, we notice some really stark differences. 
you can see pretty clearly for the spectral rep response curves of the low, moderate, and high burn severity that you can see here. Where healthy vegetation has that really large peak in the near infrared, bare soil and burned areas have much lower peaks in the near infrared. And in the case of high severity burned areas, there's much less response in the near infrared. You can see that healthy vegetation typically has low reflectance in the short wave infrared, but burned areas have high reflectance in those wavelengths. With these spectral characteristics, we can identify burned areas and distinguish them from healthy vegetation. To take advantage of this difference in spectral response between healthy vegetation and burned areas, we use the normalized burn ratio, or NBR, to map post-fire conditions. NBR uses remote sensing data in the near infrared and the shortwave infrared to map burned areas, and ultimately, this can help us assess burn severity. You can see how this calculation is completed here on the slide. And similar to NDVI, NBR is a unitless value ranging from negative one to one. A high NBR value that is closer to one indicates healthy vegetation, while a low value that is closer to negative one indicates recently burned areas and bare ground. NBR is, com is a commonly used metric for identifying areas where vegetation has recently burned during a fire. Here you can see an example of the NBR in action. The images show pre, during, and post NBR from the Mendocino complex fire. And this was a really large fire that occurred in California in 2018. And the red area, as you can see, outlines where the fire occurred. NBR is also critical to burn severity estimates. To estimate severity, we compare NBR pre and post fire using the difference normalized burn ratio or DNBR. Here we have a super basic run through of how this works. First, we calculate the NBR prior to a fire and then after a fire, and then we take the difference between those two images. You'll note that the DNBR is calculated by subtracting the post-fire NBR from the pre-fire NBR. Once DNBR is calculated, an analyst will need to threshold the DNBR values into classes of low, moderate, and high burn severity to produce a map that looks like the one that you can see here on the right where the high burn severity areas are mapped in red. There are suggested thresholds for burn severity mapping. And when we go through the example today, we're going to be using one from the US Forest Service. Um, and it, it's a great starting point and a really commonly used uh, thresholding. Um, but you can also modify this based on your region and if you are more familiar with, with the area. So we'll be going through all of these steps with both of our exercises today. I also wanted to briefly mention um, a variant of the difference normalized burn ratio. And this is called the relativized difference or normalized burn ratio or RDNBR. And this was developed um, in 2017, and the RDNBR attempts to account for differences in vegetation in areas with high or low vegetation cover. So it measures the relative change in regard to the pixels. For example, sometimes areas with low canopy cover appear to experience low severity burning simply because there was less vegetation prior to the fire. With the RDNBR, it attempts to correct for this by noting a higher relative change in the vegetation loss in this area. The RDNBR is not always appropriate for use in every area, but it's commonly used these days along with a DNBR. Um, we won't be going through this for the purpose of our, our webinar, but I did want to mention it. Um, if you're interested in conducting something like this, you can take a look um, at the citation provided in the slide here. Okay, so now let's review a few, a few tools for post-fire mapping. Land Fire is a program under the Department of Interior and focuses on a variety of applications in the United States. 
It provides over 20 national geospatial um, layers, such as vegetation, fuel, disturbance, and ecological models that are all available to the public. One such um, layer they provide is disturbance. And this is available annually and historically for fuels and vegetation types. Vegetation disturbance data also includes transition magnitude. We also have um, historical disturbances data for California, and you can see that shown here, um, where, where the disturbance is mapped in red. So you can see we've, we've had a lot of disturbance, a lot of large fires in California. Um, and you can also take a look at the link um, here for land fire if you're interested in any of these products that are primarily for the United States. The Monitoring Trends in Burn Severity Project is also a great resource that is only available in the US. Um, this project provides the NBR, DMBR, the burn severity classifications, and the fire perimeter data. These maps are created by technicians that are um, familiar with the area they're working in for the analysis. Um, and as I mentioned, um, the project only works in the US, but um, it's a good idea to reference these methods um, for your own burn severity estimations, regardless of your study area. And the MTB, MTBS also has a data explorer um, that's really great to um, take a look at these different data layers. And it's relatively new, and it was also created um, through the API of Google Earth Engine. So it, it sort of builds off of Google Earth Engine um, as well. You can explore the MTBS Burn Severity Archive. Um, however, it's I believe it's currently limited um, to estimates from 2019 and earlier. Um, so it does take them a while to do the processing. But within the Data Explorer, you can create summary statistics. Um, you can define your area. You can analyze um, single point data. Um, by 30 by the resolution of Landsat, so um, 30 by 30 meters. And you can also download data um, as a CSV or a PNG. Um, so this is a, a screenshot shown here also of the 28 Cino complex fire in California. The QGIS fire mapping tool was created in partnership with MTBS and was developed to address the needs of users who may need to determine the effects of small fires that are below the MTBS burned area thresholds, or if you can't wait for the, um, the layer to, to come out um, before they're published. So it facilitates the identification and processing of Landsat imagery that correspond to a user spe specified area of interest. And it also generates fire perimeters, performs thresholding to produce burn severity um, images. Through the use of this tool, users can employ satellite-based imagery and derive information to produce their own burn severity estimates. So it's fully open source. It's freely distributed. Um, it's available for download. We've, we've also uh, mentioned this tool in previous um, our set training, so you can take a look at the um, link there um, for for that, and it is run through QGIS. So, just another um, thing to take into account. So, here's a quick rundown of the process that um, the tool uses for defining a fire perimeter and conducting the burn severity assessment to give you an idea of how it works. Um, so first you use um, another data source. So you can pull data from things like Worldview or firms to identify a fire. And then you can use um, this in QGIS to enter the fire information and order your imagery. You then need to identify your pre and post fire images, similar to what we'll go through later on in our exercise. And then you'll follow instructions um, within the tool and download the prompts um, to walk through the steps of mapping um, the fire perimeter and burn severity. So it's a, it's a really great option if you're interested in mapping small fires, um, if you're a QGIS user, 
um, as opposed to somebody who is well versed in Earth Engine, it's, a, it's another uh, great resource. I also wanted to briefly mention um, NASA's Fire Information for Resource Management System, or FIRMS. And FIRMS has data available globally. And FIRMS is really focused on um, active fire mapping. As I mentioned in the last section, a lot of these tools have um, active fire, you know, has the full gamut, the pre, the during, the post fire. So there are a lot of different data sets available. But I did want to mention that they have this really great um, burned area product from um, MODIS. And you can select by the year and then um, identify burned area by the um, month of that year. So here we're seeing Northern California um, in 2020, where we had the, this large outbreak of multiple fires. And you can see that most of the fires here occurred in August and September. Um, you can also download data directly from um, the firm's website as well. And I know we reviewed um, GWIS, or the Global Wildfire Information System, in our session, um, our first session. But I also wanted to mention that it um, can be used for active fire mapping and for post-fire burned area. Um, we discussed earlier the MODIS burned area product, um, and you can also find it here. Um, and then you can compare it to things like the near real time MODIS and VIRS um, hotspot data. I also wanted to highlight a really fantastic tool from the Land Processes Distributed Active Archive Center, or LPDAC. And this tool is called Appears, and it allows you to extract point and area location data for many of um, the available data sets that are provided through the LPDAC. Um, the great thing about this is that you can view the data prior to downloading it. You can interact with the data. You can make um, some of your own plots and analyze the values of those plots. And um, there are many data sets available and those relevant to this training are the MODIS and VIRS burned area products as well as the neural time thermal anomalies for identifying actively burning fires. Um, so I do encourage you to take a look at this um, great resource from LPDAC as well. Okay, so now that we've reviewed um, an overview of uh, post-fire mapping and provided some examples of tools you can use, let's talk a little bit more explicitly about Google Earth Engine, which we'll be using for our, our post-fire mapping um, exercises today. So you may have already heard um, about Google Earth Engine. You might be a super user, um, but for those of you who aren't, um, this is a great resource for cloud-based raster computing of remote sensing data. Um, computing in the cloud has a lot of benefits um, since you're not limited to your own personal computing capabilities. You may also be able to process larger data sets simultaneously to reduce time that it takes to process data. Cloud resources can also typically host and store more data than what you have available. And since the cloud can be accessed from anywhere, um, you don't have to have um, them all with you each time you're running the analysis. Um, additionally, the platform is freely available for scientists, researchers, and developers, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. So the GE platform leverages the advantages of cloud computing and provides user with a single place for accessing satellite data. Um, also for applying some of our methods and displaying results. Um, Google's access to data storage and computing infrastructure allows the platform to host these data sets and um, provide access to global imagery archives. Um, in particular, for this training series, we're going to be looking at um, the archives of Landsat as well as um, potentially Sentinel-2. The GE JavaScript API, and specifically the GE code editor interface, which we'll be using, um, is the most common method for interacting with GE. It's also the most frequently used by developers and has 
And there are a lot of useful scripts and base codes that are already out there. I know many of you probably have experience working with things like Python, um, and you can also use Python um, through Earth Engine rather than JavaScript, um, but we'll be focusing on the JavaScript application here. Um, the Python API is available through Google Collaboratory or Colab. Um, and I'm not an expert at this. I've heard it can be a little bit um, more difficult to use, but that is an option. Um, and then Google Colab also um, specializes in interacting with Jupyter Notebooks. So if that's something that you're familiar with, um, that's a great uh, thing to take a look at as well. So a quick survey of some of the basic functionalities of Earth Engine relevant to um, satellite imagery analysis. Um, you can do things like automation of data processing and display, near real-time monitoring. Um, you can apply machine learning algorithms. Um, in particular, we've in the past, we've talked um, about things like uh, random forest as a land cover classifier. Um, and then there are also uh, the option to create a um, user interface that builds off of the um, coding interface. And so Climate Engine is a perfect example of that. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, Earth Engine has a lot of potential for land monitoring applications. Applications like long-term monitoring of landscape change, computation of um, vegetation indices, snow cover, um, looking at time series and change detection of land surface features. Earth Engine also includes functionalities for calculating summary statistics, um, for running validation and accuracy assessment, and then of course for visualizing these results. Um, so it's a really robust platform that includes a lot of the pieces that you would want to use for um, doing this type of analysis. So I also briefly wanted to mention some of the relevant satellite data products that are hosted and available through Earth Engine. So Earth Engine essentially is pulling a lot of these data sets from the DACs that are serving them out. Um, whether it's via USGS or um, the um, European Space Agency, things like that. The first here and the, the um, data that we'll use today are the Landsat series. So the total series covers 1972 to present with data from Landsats 4 through 8. Um, I believe they'll be pulling in Landsat 9 data soon as well. Um, and then this also includes raw images top of atmospheric reflectance and the surface reflectance products. So a lot of times we'll use the surface reflectance products that have already been um, pre-processed. And then these products are separated into tiers um, where we have tiers one, two, and three based on how much pre-processing is, is occurring. And um, you can access the data catalog um, so you can see all of the data available on Earth Engine uh, via this link I, I'm showing here at the bottom of the slide. Sentinel-2 data is also available through Earth Engine and includes the top of atmosphere and surface reflectance products. The applications of Sentinel-2 are really similar to Landsat, um, but there are a few notable differences. Sentinel-2 has a higher spatial resolution, um, it has a, a shorter revisit time, so it's taking imagery of the same place on Earth about every five days, um, but it has less um, temporal coverage, and the data really doesn't start until 2015. So um, there's always trade-offs when we think about the use of different um, sensors. And in our exercise today for the Bolivia example, you'll see you have the ability to modify the script in order to use Landsat imagery or Sentinel-2 imagery. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Earth Engine also contains the MODIS archive. Um, and you're probably already familiar with, with um, MODIS. 
These data are available from um, 2000 to present day. And um, it's a really popular um, imagery and data layer because you can receive data globally um, on a daily cadence. It has a coarser spatial resolution and some of those are listed here. But they do also have pre-processed products available. So with MODIS and with VIRS, for example, they'll have products of NDVI um, available for you already without you running the calculation yourself. Um, so you can take a look at the um, MODIS catalog and all of the products available from MODIS at that link here as well. Another data set that you might find useful is Sentinel-2. And this is a, a synthetic aperture radar data or SAR. And it's already pre-processed and, and ready to go and work in Earth Engine. Um, while we're only focusing on optical imagery for this session, we have had previous RSET trainings. Um, in particular, I mentioned this last time as well, but our forest mapping and monitoring with SAR data training that we've provided the link for there um, uses Earth Engine and um, Sentinel-1 data for looking at forest mapping. Um, so please take a look at that if you're interested in this data source as well. So I mentioned this briefly when I uh, talked about the MODIS slide, but there are also a variety of processed land cover um, layers available in Earth Engine. So the one shown here is um, a data example from the Copernicus Global Land Cover Layers data set. And there are also layers in displaying the MODIS land cover products. So I mentioned a lot of the uh, products are readily available via MODIS and land cover is one of them. Um, there are also other um, land cover maps um, available like the USGS National Land Cover databases. So you can take a look here at all of the different land cover products available. Um, but we have also discussed how to generate your own land cover map um, for your region in previous RSET trainings. So that was a really quick overview of the uses of Earth Engine and a few of the data products that are available. Um, for this training, we'll be using Earth Engine for burn severity mapping. I mentioned we'll be focusing on Landsat 8 data, but you have the option to modify for Sentinel-2 as an additional um, step if you'd like to um, take a look at those data. We'll be walking through our calculation of the normalized burn ratio and the difference NBR. Um, and we'll use some thresholding and identify categories of burn severity mapping within Earth Engine. And I'll mention this again, but I really want to highlight and um, uh, mention this UN spider burn severity mapping in Google Earth Engine training. So large portions of the code uh, we'll be presenting today, in particular the Bolivia example, were um, used directly from the UN Spider um, burn severity training. So I really uh, encourage you to reference um, that resource. It's a fantastic resource and um, was really the basis for a big portion of the code that we created um, in particular for our, our second example. Um, it's really flexible. You can use it in different regions um, and it, it's, it's a fantastic resource. So I can't stress that enough. Um, to, to take a look at that. And given that we are focusing on Earth Engine for our exercise today, there are advantages and disadvantages of Earth Engine. We've talked a lot about the advantages already. Um, we've talked about the ability for rapid processing of imagery in the cloud and the, the fact that it's free for non-commercial use. Um, you have the ability to access and integrate many different data sets, um, in particular, the ability to monitor um, phenomena on a global scale is, is so helpful. And, um, and it does have this flexible access through APIs that are created off of the Earth Engine code. And Climate Engine is a great example of this. Um, you may be familiar with Global Forest Watch, which is another great example of this. Um, but I will say it's not perfect. There are some quirks, um, especially as you become a more advanced user. 
there are some limitations in the processing operations. And we'll actually see that if you take a look really explicitly in our Bolivia example. Um, you often cannot run batch operations that take over five minutes to process without a cost. So I mentioned it's free for non-commercial use for researchers, for nonprofits. Um, but if you're a private organization, there is a cost associated with it. I'm not familiar what those look like. You'd have to take a look at their website there um, to, to see what the costs are associated with it. But that is something to keep in mind. Um, and then also complex processing can be challenging. Um, one feature in particular that has been challenging for me, and I will admit I'm, I'm not an advanced user, um, and but we'll see this as we work through the code, is that um, the, the way Earth Engine works is it, it tends to create these composite images um, where it stitches together multiple dates. And it does this for a good reason, to um, help with cloud cover, to help with um, data quality issues. But in doing that, it's often difficult to determine which pixel is from which date um, because it uses pixels from multiple dates to create the, the image composites. Um, so if you're really interested in something that um, in doing your analysis uh, over pixels all from the same image, you have to be very explicit about that. And we'll we'll talk about that as we go through the exercise. But that's one thing that that sticks out to me. And, and as someone who has been um, a remote sensing user for, for many years is something that's kind of unique um, when using the cloud computing platform as opposed to say downloading a single image yourself and running the processing on something like um, Airdos Imagine or Envy or, or even ArcGIS, it's, it's a very different model. Um, so just something to be aware of as you work through. Okay, and as I mentioned in session one, um, we are focusing on these case studies as our examples for running this analysis. And I wanted to just briefly mention those again. Um, so the first example is the Litton Creek fire. It began on June 30th. Um, it destroyed much of the town of Litton, Canada. Um, and it occurred after this record-breaking heat wave where we saw temperatures reaching um, nearly 50 degrees Celsius, which is about 121 degrees Fahrenheit, the hottest values ever recorded in the country. Um, this came as part of a record-breaking heat wave over Canada and much of the um, northern uh, western U.S. Um, and the fires were um, a really, really impactful to indigenous communities in the region as well. Um, and I didn't mention this last session, but I wanted to highlight this really fantastic ArcGIS story map that was created um, by um, one of my colleagues, Sativa Cruz, as well as um, collaborators from Esri Canada um, about this fire in particular. So do please take a look at this, this fantastic story map that, that really tells the story of the fire. Um, and this is available um, via ArcGIS story maps. So for the Litton Creek fire, um, for this exercise, uh, we are going to be working through six steps. First, we're going to load a pre and post fire Landsat image. We're going to calculate the normalized burn ratio for the pre and the post fire images. Then we're going to calculate the difference MBR for both the pre and post um, by doing this, this um, subtraction. And then we're going to classify the burn severity and add a legend. Then we're going to calculate the burned area and finally export the burned area statistics as a CSV. So um, here is the link to the code. Um, we'll be working through this example in, in great detail after the lecture portion is over. I will mention that the code is entirely commented out for this Litton Creek example, and we'll we'll talk through that and what that means as we go through the example. In our second case study example, we're focusing on this large wildfire outbreak in Bolivia that occurred in the summer of 2020. And as I mentioned in the first session, the fires expanded to large regions and prompted the government to declare a state of emergency. 
Um, this was linked to the AMO, this climate um, oscillation that generally decreases rainfall and increases temperatures in the region. Several ecosystems were affected, not only in Bolivia, but in um, surrounding um, Brazil and Paraguay. And for this example, um, we are going to only focus on Bolivia, but I wanted to mention that these fires really burned in quite extensively um, in the Pantanal wetlands, um, which is the largest tropical wetland in the world. It's really biologically diverse. Less than 5% of the, the region is protected. And in 2020, um, the region saw over 8,000 fires. Um, and you might say, well, it's a wetland. How did these fires spread so dramatically? Um, they were experiencing the worst drought in 47 years. So much of the area that is typically underwater was dry, which allowed for this, this spread. Um, I also wanna reference another great story map that I found while doing some research um, on the, these fires. Um, and the link is shown here. And this is another great resource and information in particular about this region. Um, so what we'll see in our exercises, we'll see some of the um, burns that occurred in the Bolivia portion, but as you can see from this map here, much of the wetlands are actually located in Brazil as well. For this Earth Engine script, I mentioned earlier um, the um, UN's the UN Spider and Knowledge Portal, and um, most of this script was generated by them and was slightly modified by me. Um, so for this one, we have the option to use Landsat 8 or Sentinel-2, um, and we will be running through many of the same steps as the Canadian example. So for this one, it's, it's a much longer code. It's a more flexible code. Um, I would say more easily modifiable for your region. Um, it also has a few extra steps like applying a cloud and snow mask um, and the ability to mosaic and clip images for your study area. Um, and we'll also be you know, running some of the same steps such as calculating the burned area, um, looking at the burned area statistics and the, the link to the code is here. I will mention that we won't be going through this code in explicit detail in a step-by-step -step manner in the um, exercise portion for today, but I encourage you to run through the code um, during the lab time and take a look at it yourself. Um, it's a really, it's really great code. Um, and, and you can modify it uh, to take a look at your region in particular. For this code that I've provided, I have not commented everything out. So as you'll see, it'll run um, automatically. All of these steps will occur. Um, it's a very large code, so I didn't want to um, require you all to delete the comments for um, many of these steps. So um, just a note there with the, with the Bolivian example. Okay, so to summarize, um, fire impacts many aspects of the ecosystem. Things like soil chemistry, watershed dynamics, vegetation extent and type, and many other features. We talked a little bit about how remote sensing can be used to assess the burned area extent, burn severity, and vegetation regrowth. And we also mentioned some of the tools for assessing post-fire landscapes, um, such as land fire, firms, MTBS, GWIS appears, and then of course, Earth Engine, which we will take a look at soon. As we discussed last week or last session, um, there are many resources available here with links to um, information in particular about the fires. So um, as we did for our first session on Tuesday for our remaining time together, um, first I will step you all through our um, Canada example for our Earth Engine script. Then we will have some time where uh, we will answer some of your questions that you've been asking along the way here. And then we will remain online um, for the remainder of our time in this three hour session as you work through the exercises. So we're here to help you um, to answer questions 
And this might involve you know, pulling up and sharing our screen or talking through some um, challenges that many of you are, are seeing um, along the way. As a reminder, here is the contact information for myself and my colleague Juan. Um, you again can find all the information about this training at the training website here. And then I want to put a plug in for the variety of really fantastic R set resources that we have for different application areas like uh, water resources, health and air quality, um, disasters, and, and many more. So do take a look at the R set webpage if you're interested in, in running um, in taking any of these other trainings or in different topic areas. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter where we'll announce upcoming trainings and things like that. So let's go ahead and jump right into our hands-on exercise where we'll be doing our post-fire mapping with Google Earth Engine. Okay, so now moving on to our exercise, what you can see here is the um, Earth Engine code that was provided in the lecture. So you all can um, take a look at this code on your computer. Um, you can also just sit back and watch as we talk through this code. Um, and then you can come back to yours later and actually run it on, on your own. But I want to um, outline a few things here before we actually jump in. Um, we have a lot of uh, comments. Uh, I heavily commented this code so that we, we all know what's going on. We've listed the training website here. Um, the fact that this is our um, Litton Canada example. I've referenced the UN Spider uh, website where you can find um, some more information in particular for the Bolivia example. Um, and I provided a little bit more information here about the um, Litton Canada wildfires, stuff we talked about during the lecture. I've also outlined the steps for this exercise. Um, so as we mentioned in the lecture, we have six steps that we'll be working through here. And for this example in particular, we're going to be going through the code step by step um, in small batches. And the way in which you can do that is you need to comment out all of the processes um, because the way Earth Engine works is it'll run all of the um, code that you give it all at once. Um, so the, the way to just focus on a few different steps is to comment everything out and then delete those comments for the steps that you want to run. Um, and once every, all the comments are deleted, uh, it'll run the entire code. And the way that we create comments, as you can see here, um, are with these two um, hash lines here. Um, so that's why all of this is green. Whenever you see a green portion, that means it's commented out. It's not actually running in the software. Um, I also want to mention that I won't be reviewing like the basics of Earth Engine. Um, there, there are so many resources available via Google for those types of things. Um, but we'll be talking through this code really explicitly. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, I'm not an expert in Earth Engine. So many of you online might have suggestions on how to modify this code or have shortcuts or um, other suggestions. And we're, we're really open to that. And um, especially as we try to build a larger community around um, some of this work, feel free to, to let us know if you have suggestions on changes and we can um, you know, tell, tell everyone as we go through. So, so I just want to caveat uh, as we step through that here. Um, and I also want to mention that all the comments for this code, I've, I've done the hashtag, hash signal and um, these, these two symbols here that you can see. So you can really make note of where um, you need to delete the code and where the comments versus the actual portions of code that we want to run are, are located. And you'll see that as we work through it. We also have some Landsat 8 information here. This is the um, imagery we'll be using for this example. Um, there's a website here where you can find information on all of the bands and what those are. Um, and I also want to mention that for this example, we took a look at the images using Earth Explorer. So 
what we did prior to the selection of these pre-fire and post-fire image dates is we took a look at the imagery on Earth Explorer. And, and that might not be a process that is very common, um, but for this as a starting point, I wanted to start off really simply where we're just looking at two discrete images. And I mentioned in the lecture where if we select a wide um, time range, we can create, or Earth Engine will create these composite images that have pixels from multiple dates. So um, with that um, comes a little bit of uncertainty. Um, so I wanted to start off really simply. In, in the, the Bolivia example, you'll see that um, you can specify a date range. So you don't actually need to do any work ahead of time and looking at the imagery and trying to find images that have low cloud cover, those types of things. But, but that's something I did here um, and just to, to sort of cover our bases. So for part one, the first thing we're going to do is load the pre and post fire Landsat images. And so we can see here, um, I'm going to go ahead and um, delete our comments out for the portions of the code that we want to work through. And I'll talk through what these mean as I um, delete these portions out. So the first thing is we're loading a pre-fire image. The pre-fire image is from August 9th, 2018. And this is the, the variable here that we're identifying as the pre-fire image. And then the image is this very specific um, Landsat name. Um, in, in past presentations with RSET, we've talked a lot about the naming convention of Landsat. Earth Engine uses the similar naming convention to pull the correct image of interest um, to display in the map. So what we can see here is, this, is Landsat 8, um, Tier 1, Level 2. Um, the, and then we can see the actual date shown here. This is the, um, the, band, the path and row. So this will specify the area over Lytton, Canada, where the um, image was taken, and then the date here. Um, so you can refer to this. And then what we're going to do is visualize the parameters, and we're going to just look at a natural color image. So you can see um, blue, green, red uh, bands here. And if you refer to that uh, information about the Landsat bands, you can see um, that those are bands six, five, and three. And um, here we're using a surface reflectance product. So that's why it's SR. So we're essentially just loading the pre-fire image here. And then below we're loading the post-fire in, in exactly the same way. So um, the post-fire image is going to be from September 2nd, 2021. Um, as, you, as you note, the, uh, the, the uh, excuse me, there we go. Um, the fire occurred in late June um, and into July of 2021. So this is a relatively cloud-free image. Um, after the fire occurred. And you want to make sure that the image is long enough after the fire occurred to where you're not still seeing smoke in the image from the fire burning itself. Um, so that's what we're doing with that portion there. And now we're going to just center the map. And the way that we're centering the map is we're using the Latin long from Lytton, Canada. And um, then this piece here where we see seven, this is the zoom level. So you can change this to zoom in and out closer or further away from your area of interest. And now, and then we're going to add our map layers. So we're going to add our pre-fire image and our post-fire image using the parameters we set for natural color. And then we're giving them these pre-fire and post-fire names. And then um, we just want to print the images to the console on the right so that we can essentially store them for later. If we wanna download them or take a look at them, um, they'll, they'll show up here um, on this, this console portion to the right. So now that we've um, comment, de-commented our first part of our script, we can just click on run. So what you can see here is we've zoomed into the area of Lytton, Canada. We're, we're, we're zoomed out at a, a seven, um, if you increase that number, you'll zoom in higher. 
Um, what we can see here on, under the layers is we have our pre-fire image and our post-fire image. And we can just kind of take a look here. You can always zoom in and out more if you're interested in this. Um, we'll do that a little bit later, but by turning these layers on and off, you can see first the pre-fire image and then the post-fire image. And it may be difficult to see the differences here initially, but we'll we'll talk through those um, as we uh, identify the burn scars um, and take a look more closely. Now, the next part is we're going to calculate the normalized burn ratio or the NBR. And we've given the uh, equation for that here. And again, um, this is really just referring to which bands are which for Landsat in particular, and then running this calculation. We have the pre-NBR, we're using the normalized difference, which is a function that's readily available in Earth Engine for the near infrared band and the shortwave infrared band for both our pre and post fire images. And then again, we are going to print this to the console and we can, we can click on run to run this portion, but the images aren't going to be showing up um, just yet because we have not printed them um, to the map itself, which we'll do in our part three. But we've done the calculation. We can see here in our console on the right with um, this ran perfectly and we have um, each of those images available. But we want to um, display those images in a particular way, which we'll do here in part three. So now um, the result we're going to um, calculate the difference NBR. So what we essentially need to, to do is um, subtract the uh, pre-NBR from the post-NBR, and that's what we're doing in this step. And then we're scaling it to USGS standards. And I mentioned that previously, that the USGS has this great resource for how we're, we're mapping burn severity. And this essentially is just um, multiplying by a thousand to scale up our values. Then we're going to add the difference image to the console on the right, like we did with the previous examples. And then we're going to identify how to display the, the products. So first we're going to display them in grayscale. Um, so we're doing grayscale of white and black. Then we're going to um, we would like to display the pre and post fire NBR separately. So in the um, step two, we calculated this pre and post NBR. We printed it to the console on the right, which is sort of our holding place for the images where we can take a look at the st statistics. Um, but now we're going to add them to the map. So this map dot add layer is going to, to do that for us. Um, we've identified the min and max values. As I said, this is a ratio between negative one and one. The palette is going to be grayscale. Um, and then we've identified the pre and the post fire NBR. And then finally, we're going to display our difference NBR or DNBR. And because we've scaled this to the USGS standards, the values will go between negative a thousand and a thousand. The palette is still gray, and then we're still looking at the grayscale here. So now we can click run again. We can see in our console, as soon as we click run, that the DNBR is now here on the right, and we see some um, new layers being displayed. So here, if we hover over layers, we can see um, three more layers displayed. So we initially had the pre-fire and the post-fire image, but now we've displayed the pre-fire and post-fire NBR, which is needed for that um, calculation that we run. And then we are showing the um, difference NBR or that DNBR. So we can turn these on and off to take a look at each of those layers, pre-fire image, post-fire image, pre-fire NBR, post-fire NBR. So we can start to see some differences, in particular, some differences up here in the northeastern quadrant of our Landsat scene. And then we can look at the DNBR in grayscale. Again, um, now that we're looking at the DNBR, we can start to see some um, differences 
up here in this portion of the, the image. Um, and that's what we're really going to use um, for our classification and for our coloration um, of the uh, different NBR. Um, so again, this essentially is subtracting the post-fire NBR from the pre-fire NBR. So now let's go back to our code. And the part four that we're going to work through now is um, classifying the burn severity and adding a legend. So much of this code, this part of the code was created by the um, folks with UN Spider. And a lot of this portion of the code is specifying colors and labels and adding a legend um, and is, is really doing that sort of coloration and displaying and not much of the uh, raster analysis. Um, so I, I would refer you to um, this, this website for what's being done here um, for a lot of these color maps. And you can also find the colored codes and things like that um, via help with um, Google and Earth Engine itself. So the first thing we're going to do is define the discrete intervals for which we will apply to the image. And these intervals are identified by those um, standards set uh, by the USGS, and those are made available again on the UN Spider website. So what we're doing here is we're identifying the intervals with which we are thresholding our differenced NBR map. And then we are identifying um, the colors that we want them to be from essentially from green to red. Um, we are identifying the labels. Um, again, those are the value thresholds for our levels of burn severity. Um, we're creating the color map and we're symbolizing this in our raster. So there's a lot here, such as the color, the, the value and the label. And this can be applied for a lot of different rasters that you're um, coloring up and symbolizing with just some slight modifications to the color and the um, labels. So then we're going to add this image to the map using those color ramp and interval schemes that we just identified. And we're going to separate this into the eight burn severity classes, those classes that I mentioned. So this is essentially thresholding your image into these different classes. And we'll see the values of these classes and what those mean in terms of the designations of burn severity. So um, here we're taking our um, DNBR, we're applying those thresholds, um, we're reducing them and essentially applying it to the entire um, DNBR image that we've created. So now we'll step through, again, um, more of the um, sort of fine tuning of the way things look in Earth Engine, such as setting a legend. So this is the first piece is essentially setting the position of where we want the legend to be. The legend is going to uh, be displayed in the sort of the bottom left portion of our um, map below. We are going to create a legend title. Um, we are going to call that legend DNBR classes. We're going to make it bold, the text, then we're going to identify the font size as 18, um, specify the margins and the padding. We're not adding any, any padding, so it's going to go directly in the um, bottom left. And again, um, these can be found, you can do some simple Google searches for legend and creation of these things um, in Earth Engine. And then we're going to add the title. We are going to specify the color and the name and essentially uh, create a label that designates the specified color that we've identified for each of the burn severity classes and tie those to the correct, um, the correct designation. So again, um, we're applying a label we're um, identifying the background color is going to be white. We're giving padding to um, essentially the, the box that where the legend is located. We're identifying where, where this text will occur. 
And then we're creating the label for the text itself. So we're um, giving it a name. We're again specifying this particular margin, the location. And then after you've specified all of these things, you need to return it. So you need to actually tell Earth Engine to, to display it. And um, that is displayed using the, the um, widgets. So widgets are these cool little features that you can apply to display random things. You can add things like a time slider if you're looking at variety of different dates. Um, you can uh, add legends as we're going to, to show you here. Um, and there are a whole suite of widgets that you can um, take a look at. Now, um, we're identifying the color palette for our um, each of our categories. So you'll see um, this will be colors from green, orange, yellow, red. Again, you can look these up and um, find what these color designations mean by doing a simple Google search. Now we're specifying each of these categories in the name on the legend. So you can see we're going to look at enhanced regrowth, high, enhanced regrowth, low, unburned, low burn severity, moderate burn severity, moderate low burn severity, moderate high burn severity, high severity, and then any pixels that don't fall within these categories. Um, maybe it's like the edge of the scene. Um, maybe it, it, it's a, a, a pixel that um, doesn't meet these thresholds. A lot of times we'll just put NA in there just in case there are any additional pixels that are uh, maybe on the edges of the scene, things like that. So these are the categories that we will um, have for our burn severity map. And all this does is it applies the specifics that we outlined prior to this. Um, it's essentially running a function for each of these eight categories. It's applying the legend specifics and making rows and names for each of these um, pieces of the legend. Um, so this is like an iterative process that occurs and assigns this along the way for each of the legend properties. And then finally, we're going to add the map to the legend. So I know that's a lot of code for what seems to be a pretty simple step of, of adding a legend, but there are a lot of um, different combinations. You can really be specific with the way these look. So um, you can modify these based on your interests and um, how you want things to really look. So with that, we will click run again. And you can see right away that our legend populated here um, on the, uh, the bottom left, we have our DNBR classes that we identified. Um, the color is appropriate for what we'd assume to be regrowth or unburned or low and moderate low, moderate high severity. So now, if we take a little closer look at our um, map, we can zoom in a bit and we can again focus in on these regions really close to the town of Lytton. So let's take a nice close look at these and you can move around the panel. Um, you'll see that with each zoom, what's happening is the layers are displaying again. We have these five layers that we had initially and now we have this classified. Um, layer. So let's go ahead and turn all of them off. Let's orient ourselves. Um, we have Lytton here, um, that town that much of the town burned. Um, and we have our pre-fire image, our post-fire image. You can start to see some features here. We have our pre-fire NBR, our post-fire NBR in grayscale, the difference NBR, and then this classified image. So what we can see here is right near the town of Lytton, um, this pretty large fire perimeter. Um, here we see some other major fires. Um, like I said, this was a, a pretty extensive fire outbreak across the region. Um, so you see what looks like, you know, the outline of four fire perimeters. And if you had the other Landsat images along the, the edges here, you'd probably see this extend into um, these regions on the map as well. So 
that is looking good. Um, we have an idea of the severity. We can see that much of the, the fire severity was a, a low to moderate. And again, this might uh, also depend on the, the designation, the classification that you've, you've set. Um, we've again used that, that simplified classification, but um, it might not be the most appropriate for this region. So um, you could take a look at other thresholding um, values and change those to see um, if the, the burn was more severe. Um, you could compare it with ground-based estimates of severity and see how it compares. Um, there's a variety of things that you could do if you had more information. Um, you'll also see that some of these um, areas are white where um, it was either snow or cloud cover, particularly probably snow in this region. And those were excluded from our classification. Okay, so now if we come back to our code, we are now on part five. So part five, we're gonna calculate the burned area. So we're essentially going to take a look at the entire um, DMBR and we're gonna calculate uh, with how many pixels fall into these different categories. And um, like I mentioned in the lecture, uh, there are some limitations to the processing of um, data um, within Earth Engine. Um, there is a limit to the number of pixels that can be included into these class statistics, which I've outlined here along the top. So, for example, if you were to run these calculations over the entire image, um, you would get an error because there are too many pixels, likely too many pixels included in the unburned area for the process to execute properly. So what I've outlined here is identifying a geometry just around these per this perimeter, essentially just, just um, selecting out the areas where we know the fire is occurring and being very specific about where we're calculating these, these estimates. So um, you can do that uh, really simply by um, using these features here to draw a shape or draw a rectangle. But what I've done here is I've done that and then I've, I've taken a look at the lat and long of the endpoints, so the end boxes of, of that rectangle to create this geometry so that the process will just run over this specific geometry. So we will just run over the region where we know the fires are occurring. And this will likely happen to you if you are interested in analyzing a really large burnt area and if you want to get the st statistics. So um, something to keep in mind of a way to uh, identify your geometry and then essentially say, hey, we're going to look at this feature collection. So we're going to look at this imagery just over where we've specified the geometry or that polygon to be. And then we're going to count the pixels in this area. So that's what this step is doing here. Um, we're taking a look at the uh, classified um, images from the entire layer. Um, we're using a reducer essentially to um, count all of the pixels in each class. We know the scale is 30 because it's Landsat and it's a 30 by 30 meter pixel. And then um, we're taking a look at um, all of the pixel stats to get a sum. So we're counting up all the pixels in each class and then we're extracting a pixel count as a number. So then we're just um, adding all of those up for each of the categories. Now with a lot of functions where you're creating a list, you need to essentially create a holding place for where you're going to store those data points. So that's what this is doing here. An area list is what we're calling it as a variable. And then the, the brackets indicate like, hey, we're gonna put some information into this area. Um, so now this is the function where we're deriving the extent of um, each of the burn severity classes. So we're doing a count and we're using the, the class number that we calculated here and then the name of each of these categories. Again, we're using a reducer. This is a very common thing with uh, Earth Engine code where you just have to ensure that we're applying the function over 
the entire area of interest, whatever it may be. Um, and then we're identifying the um, pixels. We're also calculating the hectares. So we're doing this by um, you, uh, understanding that a Landsat pixel is 30 by 30 meters, so um, which is 900 square meters. Um, so we're multiplying by 900 and dividing by 1,000 to get the um, hectares. We're also going to be calculating the percent of each class and round it to two decimals. Um, so we're doing that. That's what this function is doing here. And then what we're essentially saying is we're going to, hey, we want to look at the class name, the number of pixels, the number of hectares, the percentage for each of these categories of interest. And we have to tell it which, which classes we want to analyze like we did before. And like we also did before, we have to execute the function over every single class. So uh, the um, function is being executed over these eight um, classes and um, the area count are these different, um, are each individual class, I, and then the names. Um, so we're, we're uh, identifying the pixels in each category um, given these, these names. And then we're going to print the values here to the console. So we can take a look at those values after we, we run this operation. Great. So now, again, we will go ahead and click on Run. You can see our map is loading again with all the um, features that we calculated. And there was nothing that really changed to the map itself. Again, we can zoom in. We had, um, it's important to note that because we've commented out all the lines of code above this, every process is running again. <laughs> so every time it'll run all of those steps for us again. So it resets the zoom, for example. And here, if we take a look at our console on the right, you can see now in the bottom, we have our burned area by severity class. So if we just use this down arrow, we can start to look at each of the categories and the properties. So for example, let's take a look at low severity. This is our low burn severity. These are the hectares that, that have been identified, the percentage, the percentage of the um, polygon, that geometry that we identified, um, that you can display um, if you want to take a look at that. And um, then we identified that Almost 13% of the pixels are in low severity class, and then we have the number of pixels. So we can take a look at these things here. We can take a look at every single category of interest that we've identified. Um, so that's a really nice feature where you can come in and do some quick uh, estimation of, of stats um, in the console here. So now the final piece is um this addition actually in addition to uh something that was not provided by the the un spider code is say we want to export the burned area stats into a csv so we have these values that we're looking at in the console on the right um, readily accessible and usable for us um, and it's just a few more pieces of code here where we need to a csv and when we export the list of values to a CSV, we can then um, have the option to export that CSV to our Google Drive, which is a really cool feature. So again, we are going to um, have this variable. We're going to create an exportable list. We are going to um, take a look at the feature collection, um, the area list, which we identified previously. And we, again, are just returning each of those features that we calculated um, previously on the console. So we just have to identify this again. We want the class, the hectares, the percentage, et cetera. And then we're going to print the feature col collection again to the console to make sure it looks right, um, make sure it's something that we want to um, export. And then this last bit of code 
is creating an exportable table. It's creating that CSV table. Again, this can be applied to a variety of applications um, that you might be interested in. So what we're doing is export table to drive. We're going to create that list where when we actually do the export, which I'll show you, it'll create a folder with this name in your Google Drive. So if you've linked your drive to your um, uh, user here, it'll create this RSET pre post fire monitoring folder, and then that's where it will store this CSV. Um, this is the name of the tasks in the task tab, which we'll take a look at. And then the file format is a CSV. And then um, what we can do is identify um, the name and the export after we run this piece of, this, of the code. Now I'll just go ahead and click on run. We can see here that we are um, cataloging a new feature collection, and this is going to be our um, export of our burned area statistics. The other thing that you'll notice after this ran um, is that we um, the tasks tab turned orange. So that means, hey, there's something here to address. So let's take a look at the task tab. And I've done some, um, I've done this a few times before, so you can see I've ran a few tasks. But what you'll see is you'll have your unsubmitted tasks here. And this is our Canada burn area stats. So this last piece that we did. Now, in order to actually save this to your Google Drive, you need to click Run. And when you click Run, you can change any of these preset conditions that we had in our code. So if you want to change the name of the folder or the file name or even the file format, you can change. Um, although I would keep this as a CSV because it's only going to be a table of data. And then you can click on run. And then what you will see once this process runs is you'll have, you'll open up your, um, Google, your um, Google Drive and you'll see that folder there created for you. And you will also um, see that CSV file. Um, so we can go ahead and take a look at that now. Okay, so once that process has run, you will see in your uh, Google Drive, this RSET pre and post fire monitoring folder. And now what you can see is you'll just see this Canada burned area stats CSV. And you can see what we've done is we were able to export the class the hectares, the percentage, the pixel, and then it just has this reference of the, the type of data that we're looking at. So then you can come up here and open with Google Sheets, for example, and this will create a Google Sheet. You can also open it with Excel if you have that available. Um, and then you can see here, we have all of these data ready for us, ready to go. So if we wanna do any kind of analysis, further analysis, we have the numbers, um, this is also a great idea for doing things like land cover classification. You can see the areas um, under each different land cover classes. Um, it's a really great uh, resource to have to be able to export your data. So that was the final step for our um, Canada example here. Um, and this was a really basic overview of calculating burn area um, by severity or class um, and then exporting the stats and taking a look at those um, so this again um, this example is not as easily modifiable um, with the exception of if you know your area um, your landsat image of interest you can change these here um, really easily so while this is the end of our um, Canada example, I really briefly wanted to mention the Bolivia script and take a quick look at it because it is quite different. It's uh, much longer, much more involved, um, but you have more flexibility. Um, so let's just go ahead and take a quick look at our um, code for our Bolivia example. And I just need to um, kind of come up to the top here um, and show you what this looks like. So it looks very similar to our Canada code. Um, 
we've outlined uh, where much of this came from, and we've also outlined all of the steps. And you can see 13 steps here as opposed to the six that we went through um, on our previous example. And the biggest difference with this script is that it's easily modifiable to your region. So I wanna just step through and talk through how these modifications can be made. And I've, I've outlined this here where you can modify the study area, the date range, and the satellite platform. So you have the option to use Landsat 8 or Sentinel-2. So Sentinel-2 might be a great option for you as it has some increased spatial and temporal resolution in your region. Um, another big piece is the application of cloud and snow mask, which is really useful for a variety of applications. And, and I will say that in particular for a region like Bolivia, um, there is high cloud cover and in all of the tropics really high cloud cover very often. Um, so this can be really great, um, a great way to um, run a composite, to have many different dates, to apply a cloud mask, um, and to, to try to find the pixels that are going to be um, the most usable for your optical imagery. I will also say that in the tropics, the use of SAR imagery is, is very useful as well. So just quickly looking at parts one, two, and three, um, also note that I have not commented out the, the portions of the script that you would like to run. So you could actually just click run and generate the whole script for you here. I would encourage taking a closer look at it um, as you before you do that. Um, but what I've done here is I've identified actually a country of the world to select. Um, I've used this, this um, uh, food and agriculture organization a layer to identify Bolivia as the country of interest. So we're actually going to be generating imagery, Landsat imagery over the entire country of Bolivia. However, you could create your own geometry. So I actually went in and used this um, feature here where you click on geometry and then click on the map, a variety of steps and create your own geometry. So you can do that if you're interested in that. Um, I've given you the um, lat and long for something that's like a, a very coarse um, attempt at selecting the entire country of Bolivia, um, but you can do something like this and just include your um, endpoint lat and long for each of your own geometry. And I've also included the steps for using the polygon tool, which I just kind of showed you down below, um, to create your geometry of interest. Uh, the difference here for the Bolivia example is that we have set the pre-fire start and end dates as opposed to a specific image for pre-fire and post-fire. So what you'll see here is this is going to look at the region from January 1st, 2018 to December 30th, 31st, um, 2018. So we're, we're going to have the ability, what, what's going to happen is, is all of the images from um, that are available uh, in this region for that entire time frame are going to be selected and, and Earth Engine will create a, com, a composite image using the best pixels from this, this date range. And the same thing we set for after the fire. So if you are going to look at a specific fire of interest in your region, you can change these dates. Um, I encourage you to use anniversary dates or um, if you, one thing to think about is if you're, in particular, if you're not interested in tropical regions, the vegetation can look quite different if you're selecting um, imagery from say January or imagery from say July, especially in like the Northern hemisphere. So you might wanna be more specific about your rate date range here. Um, because this is the tropics and the, um, the vegetation cover doesn't change that much throughout the year, I've included the entire year. But you might just want to include the summer months um, within your um, date range. And then here I've selected the same parameters for after the fire. And then the final thing um, that is quite different about this uh, code is the selection of the satellite platform. So we've included details about Landsat 8 as well as Sentinel-2. And the great thing here 
is that the entirety of the rest of the code is flexible. So you can just select either Landsat 8, which is what's shown here using L8, or you can use S2. And if you type in S2 here, um, you will see that the same processes run with Sentinel-2 data. And if you take a quick glance at, say, part four, you can start to see how this flexibility is built into the code. So there are a lot of if-else statements. So this basically says, if you selected Sentinel-2 as your platform, then run this process. If you selected Landsat 8, then run this process. Um, there are differences, say, for example, in the band number, the naming convention for the bands between the two sensors. So this is how the, the code is selecting those two things. It's running the same exact process, whether or not you're using Landsat or Sentinel, but there are differences in the metadata in the naming conventions, um, and of course, the feature collection that you're you're selecting, either the Landsat or Sentinel. So really cool feature of this code and, and hats off to um, the UN Spider group for uh, creating much of this code. So I will say um, that is a brief overview of the rest of this um, code. There's a big disclaimer here. Don't edit the script past the, the three, the first three parts. Um, unless you know what you're doing, unless you're a, an expert here. And, and I'll be honest, there are, are portions of this code beyond the parts one, two, and three that I'm not entirely sure exactly uh, the details of what's going on. Many of you might be more familiar with Earth Engine and can, can modify this code um, in a variety of ways. Uh, but that is a brief overview of the Bolivia example. I won't be going through that right now, but I encourage you all to take a look at that um, as we are online for our, our lab time. Um, and feel free to ask questions as you're working through that. And, and maybe even as you were selecting a different area or a time period to take a look at a fire in your region of interest. So that concludes our exercise portion of the training today. I hope you enjoyed um, this dive into Earth Engine. It's it's such an interesting platform and, and there are so many things that you can do um, with Earth Engine. So now we will have some time for uh, questions. And then, as I mentioned, we will be online for a bit longer um, while you're working through the, these exercises um, to answer any questions that you might have. Um, so, so thanks again, and, and now we'll move into the Q&A. Great, thank you everyone, and um, bear with us for a moment as we pull up our um, question and answer documents. We've already gotten a lot of great questions from you throughout the, the training, and um, really looking forward to addressing a few of these along the way. Um, a few points I wanted to mention. Um, we have posted the link to the Earth Engine code in the chat, and the code is also available on the presentation slides for those of you who have already signed up for your Earth Engine account. Um, take a look at those there. I also want to mention that um, we will be sending a survey out to everyone after the completion of this course, and we would really love to get your feedback on um, this course in particular, in, in terms of the structure, we're trying something new with this idea of lab time. Um, and then also we really take into account your suggestions for future training topics. So if you have other ideas on trainings you would like to see coming from RCID in the next few years, let us know. Um, we really want to be meeting the needs of the community and in particular the decision-making community out there. So. Um, do provide your feedback. We, we take that into account as we do planning in the future. Um, and then like we did with our session on Tuesday, um, I'll be going through some of these questions here, maybe for about 30 minutes or so. And then um, I'll, I'll go and be quiet and allow you all to work through the Earth Engine code. And as we see um, potential for common questions coming up, 
we might jump back in and do some of the, the narration and answer some questions. And, and we've seen a few questions about Earth Engine come through already, um, but we'll just be online until um, 12, p 12 p.m. Pacific time, um, if you're in the US, um, 3 p.m. Eastern time. And um, we'll just be here to, to continue to help you out and answer questions. And, and I also um, want to acknowledge um, my colleagues, uh, Brittany and Haley, for being on with us today. And I might jump to them to help answer some of these questions as we go through them. So let's, let's jump right into to some of these questions, some really great questions today. <clears throat> The first question here, it says, high burn severity has low infrared, but it's supposed to have water absorption. Is that possible? How is that possible? So um, if you take a really close look at slides 19 and 20 from the lecture, we can see that given the spectral response curves, the high burn severity um, have higher values in the mid infrared because there's actually low water absorption. So when there's water absorption, um, there is less reflectance in the mid-infrared and therefore lower values in those spectral curves. So healthy vegetation, in, on the other hand, has lower mid-infrared values because it does have water absorption, um, because there is water in the plants there. So, um, so just take a close look at those slides and, and if you look at the figures there, you can see the differences between the reflectance values in the mid-infrared range with high burn severity versus healthy vegetation. And that's really a, a, a major feature of the ability for us to identify burned areas um, because of that difference in reflectance in the mid infrared range. So that's, that, is, that is pretty important. Okay, next question. Does the NBR hold true for grasslands and arid areas? Yes. Um, NBR can be used for grasslands and arid regions, um, but it's important to consider the vegetation cover. So if there is really low vegetation cover, um, say in a desert region, then um, you won't be seeing the difference in the NBR from the pre and the post uh, fire or event that took place on the ground. So, so again, we have to, to recognize that the the NBR is actually looking at differences in vegetation on the ground. And so if there's less vegetation on the ground, we might see less of a change between two points in time. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, it does take into account um, grassland fires, um, but I would, would say that it is very, um, very useful in more densely forested regions. Um, and this question three came up quite a lot, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll go over it a, a couple of times, but the, the question is really referring to the, the thresholding um, that we've identified uh, for the uh, application of these different uh, ranges of, uh, you know, low, moderate, low, moderate, high, high burn severity. And so this threshold is, is the one that we've used is one of the most commonly used thresholds. Um, I've provided the link there to the UN Spider website that has the table for these thresholds. And this was developed by the US Geological Survey. Um, and I believe it's used pretty um, extensively by the Forest Service as well. But I will say that this is not the end all be all to um, the thresholds of severity. And this can be um, really dependent on on your region and, and it allows for some interpretation from the analyst. And I would also say along with um, you know, much of the work that we do in the remote sensing world, we still need ground-based information and we still need that um, validation on the ground to help inform what we're seeing in the remotely sensed imagery. So, um, more importantly, if you have a better understanding of your region, if you have ground-based data, ground-based information, things like the um, composite burn index, um, that can help you modify these thresholds and these ranges based on your ecosystem and your information. So um, I will say this is just a starting point, 
um, and, and they can be modified depending on your expertise. So it's always great to have that expertise and that ground knowledge. Um, I've, I've linked to a paper that takes a look at the, this thresholding and the addition of information from the ground in order to modify these thresholds. And I will say um, that, that um, with the Lytton example, um, myself and a few of my colleagues actually went through and did some modifications to thresholding in um, the, the GIS application that we did with, with ArcGIS. And, and um, it does lead to some changes, obviously, in the number of pixels that are included in these different um, severity classifications. So um, we, you know, we didn't do any ground truthing. <laughs> Um, but I'm, I'm certain that if you had some more information about the ecosystem, you might, you might change these thresholds and, um, it, in your region. So that's a, a question that came up quite a bit, um, and there's no real cut and dry answer um, beyond sort of a starting point of um, what we've given you here. Um, and then question four is a very similar question. Um, how do we interpret the DNBR? Um, and we've given that, um, that, that information about the table from the UN Spider website uh, there in the previous question. Okay, we scroll down to question five. This is a really interesting question. Um, it says, if wildfires affect human settlements and infrastructure, it seems that vegetation-based indices would not be appropriate. Do we have alternatives that can measure that impact? Um, and that's a really great point. I, again, I mentioned that the NBR is a vegetation-based index, and I am not aware of any. That doesn't mean there aren't um, indices out there. Um, I would also say that assessment of urban impacts um, can be best done by ground truthing as well. A lot of times the impacts to the, the urban interface um, will be smaller in scale and will be a little more challenging to assess via NASA remote sensing data. Um, drone data might be a great resource for, for something like that as well. Um, and then another thought that I had was we do have this great resource from um, the VIR sensor where they provide um, nighttime light products. So this is something that has been used in um, disaster type situations, um, things like um, large fires, um, human displacement through settlements, um, earthquakes interrupting power grids. And what this does is it, it displays the lights coming off of urban areas. Um, and so this might be something else to look into. Um, if, you, if you see a fire being burned in some a uh, really large urban area that can be detected by these changes in the nighttime light, that might be something to, um, to take a look at and to think about as well. And I've provided the link there for, for more information ab about that. Um, there are other indices like um, the built up index, which is an urban index that identifies um, built up areas. Um, so that might be another thing to look into. Um, I know that the uh, trends.earth team with Conservation International um, does a lot with cal calculating urban growth. Um, so that might be something else to look into as well. That's a good question. Okay, uh, question six. In the Bolivian fires that involved many fires, why is the pre-fire situation not affected by the firm? by the burns. Um, pre and post are happening at the same time, affecting landscape temperature, et cetera. That is another very good point and um, is something to keep in mind if you're examining a landscape that is often affected by fire um, because it can be difficult to distinguish between regions that have been affected by fire in previous years where we might see regrowth in the vegetation. Um, so my suggestion would be to um, modify and change the date range for your imagery based on what you may know about the fires in the region. Um, and it's also really good to get as much information about previous burns through some kind of uh, burn area mapping product ahead of time as well. So 
Um, yes, you will see uh, the previous fire scars in regions where there are many fires occurring over multiple years, and you will see vegetation regrowth happening. Um, I also mentioned this in, in the answer to a few other questions, but there's another great resource called Land Trender, and this is an algorithm for identifying um, landscape scale changes over time. Um, and it also has a Earth Engine interface. It has a, a, a API as well as coding interface where you can apply that algorithm. And the great thing about that is you can select a region and even a pixel, and you can see changes to vegetation indices over multiple years. So you could see, for example, um, the vegetation sort of uh, being continue being stable, and then in the, a year of a fire, see the um, vegetation values really um, fall off or see the NBR values um, really, really increase. So that's another great resource for looking at changes over time, but um, it's a good point. And unless you have the ground-based information or information about previous fire location and perimeters, it can be difficult to identify exactly when those fires occurred unless you are really set on your um, time frame of interest. And, and again, that's um, also sort of why in the, in the Lytton example, we provided specific images from specific dates because we knew um, they were images from a pre and post fire, and we knew that they were relatively cloud free. And so these are all things to consider. A lot of um, limitations and things to think about. Um, okay, question seven, uh, very good question, um, and I think we, we got some help on the answer to this. So what is the difference between Earth Engine and Climate Engine that we tried out last session? Um, is it the actual satellite data or what is the difference? So um, Earth Climate Engine is essentially an application that was built on top of Google Earth Engine. So Climate Engine is just providing you with this really nice point and click GUI interface where you can select these different data sets and run some analysis yourself without having to run the code. So um, there's no difference necessarily in the data that you're, you're um, pulling. The data is being pulled the exact same way that you would pull the data from Earth Engine. Um, you just don't have to write the code and run it yourself. So, if you are less of a coder and um, more of somebody who likes that point and click and um, in, in that interface, that that's why we um, we focused on Climate Engine for for those um, pieces. Um, if you are some, somebody who is very advanced in the JavaScript coding application, you certainly could run all of the pieces that we did with Climate Engine um, for the pre-fire analysis in Earth Engine. Um, it's just a bit more involved. So that's a great question. Um, and it highlights the flexibility of Earth Engine and the ability to create these applications on top of, of this, this uh, cloud computing platform. Okay, great. So question eight, um, I was wondering if Earth Engine can evaluate soil burn severity and the post-fire effects on the watershed. So the soil burn severity estimates, and we highlighted in the lecture, particularly focused on ground-based measurements, so actually getting measurements of the soil itself and, and the physical, chemical, and biological changes that have happened, especially to the structural changes. Uh, we mentioned this in the Q&A last session a little bit, um, but those structural changes that occur in the soil can lead to things like increased runoff, decreased infiltration of water through the soil. Um, so those properties are really difficult to evaluate via remote sensing data because they are um, very uh, heterogeneous and um, can change very uh, quickly from, from place to place. So those I would, I would suggest doing ground-based assessments for. Um, in terms of impacts to the watershed, remote sensing can be used for things like this, for uh, monitoring things like landslides, 
um, for looking at sediment loading in large streams um, due to runoff. Um, and we have other trainings. Uh, we have some really great uh, folks who do trainings in disasters and water resources. And I've linked to a SAR training for landslides um, in this example. And then we have others that focus on, on water resources and watershed analysis. Um, so, so do please take a look at that. And um, and yeah, and and thinking about how remote sensing can be used again for for larger scale assessments. Um, we always have to be mindful of the scale when we're doing this type of work too. For the spatial scale edits. Okay, um, if we scroll down to question nine. What is the easiest way to figure out whether the fire is fully out and there's no smoke in your location, especially when part of the fire might be out and part of the fire might um, be still burning? Um, so that's a great question. Um, in terms of from the remote sensing perspective, how you can do this is you could take a look at um, data that's um, occurring and being provided on a higher temporal resolution like MODIS and VIRS. Um, you can look at surface reflectance data um, using things like Worldview, which I've linked here in the Q&A. Um, that will show you daily data of um, essentially smoke plumes coming off of these large fires. Um, and then you can also look at things like the active fire hotspots to see if the satellites are detecting any heat anomalies for regions where the fire is still burning. Um, in particular, you know, if, if you're not seeing a lot of smoke, but there's still um, fire um, maybe occurring at a, a, a lower level in, in that region. Um, and then again, as always, um, you know, ground-based or more local assessments using things like drone data can, or UAV, um, um, unmanned aerial vehicles can be really helpful for, for the type of um, assessment of smoke. And I will say that with this training, we did not cover the during fire piece um, specifically as it pertains more to those active fire detections as well as smoke monitoring which um, is more along the lines of our um, health and air quality experts but we did cover this in our previous fires training a bit from last summer so do please take a look at those during fire sessions i believe there were two of them focused on on smoke um, and hot spots <clears throat> okay, so question 10. Yeah, this is a real, another very good question. Um, in Bolivia, the case, it seems that the classification has some unnatural edges. It does not smoothly blend across Bolivia. Um, and why does this happen and how do I tackle it? Um, this is a great point that highlights the fact that um, tropical areas are difficult to examine um, if you're interested in land surface properties using optical data because there are clouds. Um, there are clouds very often. And um, what you're seeing likely in the Bolivia example are um, these unnatural sort of edges and lines due to cloud masking. Um, and, and in the Bolivia example um, through, you know, this code that was largely provided by the UN Spider program, there is a cloud mask. And so depending on the date range that you use and how many clouds are present within the satellite imagery within that date range, you're probably gonna see um, you know, many pixels actually just being removed from the analysis entirely, or you will see um, sort of the, these unnatural features um, that, that aren't actually occurring on the landscape. So, um, the way you can start to tackle that is uh, you have a few different options. You can change things like the date range, um, modify it to be a smaller time window um, to see if we can uh, obtain any imagery with fewer clouds. Unlikely. <laughs> um, you could change your data set. So there's the option I mentioned to take a look at Sentinel-2 data. Um, to see if maybe um, that revisit time occurring more readily um, is capturing an image with less clouds. And then I, I also want to make a plug for SAR data. Um, in tropical regions, the synthetic aperture radar data is really, really beneficial because it penetrates clouds and clouds are not an issue. 
um, but it is more challenging to work with in general. Um, and it's quite different than optical data if you're somebody who is more well versed in the use of optical data. So um, we have a lot of RSET trainings on SAR data. Um, you could take a look at, at many of those. I've, I've mentioned them in the past as well, but it's a really good point and uh, again highlights the limitations of certain types of remote sensing data and, and things to consider when, when using these data. Okay, question 11, um, there's, there's a very short answer to that. Can this analysis be done using Sentinel? Yes. Um, we, in the Bolivia code, you can actually toggle between Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2. Um, if you're interested in SAR data, you can take a look at Sentinel 1. Um, we have those um, RSET trainings, um, in particular, RSET training on forest monitoring with SAR data, where we use Sentinel 1, if you're referring to Sentinel 1. Okay, question 12, can the calculation of the relative, relativized difference NBR be incorporated into this code? Yes. Um, again, another short answer. It's not something I have done myself, but I found this really great paper where they have done this and they um, link to some Google Earth Engine code at the end. Um, this is not something I have done, so I can't comment on the validity of the, the code or the paper itself. Um, but, but that might be a great resource for you. Um, it's just a matter of taking a look at that calculation and applying it um, in much the same way that we apply the, um, the difference to NBR value. Um, I will go ahead and um, skip question 13 because um, we sort of answered this with um, the thresholding question three. I might come back to that a little bit later as well. Okay, does the NBR give any idea of how old the occurrence of the fire may be through time series data? Um, not necessarily. However, um, again, this kind of goes back to the question about Bolivia where we see a lot of fires occurring multiple years in a row. Um, if there is vegetation regrowth in a region where there was a previous fire, if there's been regrowth from the time of the fire to the time you acquired your imagery, the um, NBR values uh, will be lower. Um, you can see that again on the thresholding table where we see um, the NBR values uh, negative, less than one um, indicate regrowth in this region. So it can give you an idea of the fact that time has passed um, since the fire but it can't necessarily pinpoint the exact date when the fire occurred. Um, in order to do something like that, you might want to do some kind of time series analysis, right? Um, so you mentioned that in the question. Um, you might wanna look at monthly data or yearly data, depending on the region, to see if you can pinpoint when the fire occurred, if you're not sure. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but, um, the, a, a great resource for this is the land trender algorithm um, that you can implement in Earth Engine. Um, it has a great feature where you can, it'll, it'll map a time series of um, values of things like NDVI or NVR over time for a specific pixel. And within that, you can then see, oh, there was this significant event that occurred in this year. Um, it is yearly as far as I understand it, so um, it's difficult to get it to uh, a smaller um, temporal scale than that. Um, but you can also look at things like the MODIS burned area product. If it was a fire that occurred many years ago, um, these do take a while to process and provide those, those products, but that might be something else to look into. Um, and you can map, and that's available monthly, so you can identify uh, fires that occurred um, in different months within a year. Uh, we did that, uh, provided that as an example in our past training on some of the major California fires that occurred in 2020. That's a really good point. <clears throat> okay, uh, question 15. Um, this one refers more specifically to Earth Engine. Um, can you load a shapefile locally rather than a bounding box? Um, the answer 
there uh, is yes, and we provided a link for how to do this through the assets tab. Um, and maybe I will open it up to Brittany or Haley because I believe um, they answered this one if they want to provide any more details about that process. Um, yeah, you can absolutely use a shapefile. Uh, in Google Earth Engine, you can use the assets tab um, up in the top left corner uh, next to scripts and docs. And when you click new within the assets tab, you can upload a lot of different things including ship files, geotiffs, uh, TFR graphics, and you can even upload other things like image collections and folders. Um, and when you use your, uh, or you can use your uploaded ship file the same way that you would use a bounding box. Um, I would just add that when you do upload a ship file or you know something similar, Google Earth Engine automatically keeps that item private to your account. Uh, so if you want to use it in your code and then you want to share that code with someone, you should just make sure that you either change the privacy setting of the shapefile so that anyone can see and use it, um, or you can specifically add someone's email that has a Google Earth Engine account, so then you can kind of keep it private to you and the um, emails that you share it with. Um, you can change your shapefile's privacy by uh, hovering over it, and then you can click on this button that says Share. And that's where you can either add those emails or just make it public. Um, if you forget to do that uh, for your ship file, um, the only thing that will happen is you'll just receive an error message when you run the code saying that they can't find that ship file. So I hope that that helps. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks for that additional information on the private versus public sharing of those ship files. That's very helpful. Um, question 16. Um, this is another question about the classes uh, for the burn severity. Burn severity. I will say here um, that um, to reiterate that the the DMBR is a ratio, so you have will have values from negative one to one. And um, in the example here in the code, we just multiplied by a thousand in order to get whole numbers. So that's why you'll see um, those numbers in the array starting with negative. 1,000 indicating high regrowth in the region. Um, so you do you can take a look at that um, table there um, from the UN Spider website. And question 17 is another more specific Earth Engine um, coding uh, question. So maybe I'll turn it back over to Brittany um, if you'd like to explain the answer to to question 17, which is can you please explain what the reducer does? I can take this question, Amber. Um, Great. So uh, the reducer is a really useful function in Earth Engine. Um, and basically, it aggregates all the pixels. And I wrote region here, but it really should say parameter because reducers can be applied over space, um, like we did in this code, or over time, like if you have an image collection of uh, many different images over a time series. Uh, and applies some sort of summarizing or aggregation function that you specify to all of those pixels. So in our code here, we've used ee.reducer.count, which counts the number of pixels within the geometry that we drew. Um, but we've also used dot reduce sum, um, which adds all of the pixels within the image band that we were applying it to. Uh, and there are lots of different types of reducers uh, and different ways that you can apply them and different objects that you can apply them to. So I highly recommend that you check out the Google Earth Engine developers page because uh, they have really well thorough uh, documented guides on reducers and different examples of code and how you can apply them. Great, thank you so much, Haley, for that, for that explanation, appreciate it. Okay, so, um, a, a few of the next a couple of questions, I feel like we've answered a little bit. Um, question 18 asks if we can add a shapefile of the actual fire perimeter so that the percentages would be related to just the fire and not the surrounding unburnt area. And yes, um, the short answer to that is yes. If you have a shapefile of the fire perimeter that you can load, you can use the assets option to do that as well. Um, so I'll quickly move on to question 19 and we'll get to a couple more questions and then I do want to um, give folks time um, to work on the uh, the training without us um, yammering on. 
Um, but for, for question 19, um, again, that asks about the range of the NBR values. And you can find the differences in the thresholding there at the Young Spider website. Um, and again, um, thinking about thresholding and how that might uh, change based on your region and your expert knowledge of the area. Um, question 20 is a, is, a, is a great question. Um, so I think we'll do question 20 and 21 and then we'll, we'll pause. Um, question 20 asks, when we try to get data as quickly as possible to respond to a disaster, for example, to mobilize resources, is Earth Engine the best source or do we need to access other resources to verify and clarify? I will say that Earth Engine is a great resource um, that's pulling data from uh, many of the uh, formal repositories like the DAX. Um, if you have code already created, it's really quick to run. Um, you know, all the computing is done on the cloud, so you're not having to sort of wait to download imagery or um, fill up your computer with imagery. Um, I will say that um, there are some other resources out there that are that, that could be used for the use of remote sensing for disaster uh, response. I mentioned Worldview earlier. Worldview is really useful for um, mural time active fire detection as well as identifying smoke plumes. Um, also, NASA's disaster portal, um, I've linked to it here as well. Um, they have a great resource um, where the NASA disasters team in applied sciences works on um, specific large scale disasters and um, creates maps and um, does time series analysis and provides statistics and a lot of different things to the end user community. So that's another great resource. Um, but yeah, I will say Earth Engine is used um, for a variety of things like early warning systems. It's also used for um, uh, drought early warning systems. Um, and it's used for flooding um, disasters and things like flooding. So it is a really great resource if you know how to use it. <laughs> Um, and, and as soon as the imagery is available on these DACs, um, you know, just thinking about the latency of the imagery itself, um, they are then available on Earth Engine, so you don't have to wait um, a long time for that. Um, but I will say it's always a great idea um, retrospectively to go back and do your uh, QAQC. I know a lot of these new real-time products do have that warning uh, associated with it where um, you know, a lot of the uh, data hasn't been ground truth, for example, or um, there may be uh, less, uh, there may be more uncertainty associated with those products coming out in real time that are then modified in the historical record. So, um, you know, as a retrospective analysis, it might be useful to go back and, and do some um, more of a deep dive into the quality of those, those products. Um, okay, so. The last question I wanna address here is, is also a very good question. Um, if we ran these indices over the archive of images through time and search areas of high burn severity, we could build long-term statistics for an area or a country, but this would include de deforestation in the category of wildfire. Um, that's a great point. Um, and then any idea how we could eliminate those things. So yes, um, the, the fact that we are using vegetation indices, um, you can use the NBR to identify deforestation. You could use it to identify things like um, pine beetle effects um, on regions. And so therefore it'll be difficult to distinguish between well, what was a fire, what was a um, deforestation activity. Um, I will say, again, referencing the land tender, uh, uh, tool, um, the ability to sort of look at this over time um, allows you to at least see if there are changes that are occurring slowly, like things like mountain pine beetle effect on, on forests that might take multiple years to see um, the, the die off of, of the trees, um, and even deforestation that might be happening on a slower cadence you might be able to distinguish between deforestation and fires. Um, I will also mention, um, and we didn't include this in the presentation, we probably should have, um, Global Forest Watch is another great resource, and they do have a lot of data on fires. 
And one thing you could do is you could link up um, things like the hotspot detection of fires and compare that to your um, NBR maps, for example. And in regions where you're not um, seeing any um, thermal anomalies happening over the years, um, then you could maybe do some further investigation to see if, oh, well, maybe that was a clear cutting event versus a fire event. Um, you know, using multiple data sets and aligning them and looking at them over time might be something that you would need to do in order to um, look at these things like long term statistics. Um, but I will say that Global Forest Watch and Resource Watch, um, they're interlinked. Um, they are provided by the World Resource Institute. They do provide statistics on some of these metrics across countries and regions. Um, so you can do this for countries. Um, I believe you can do it for um, tribal lands. Um, they have a lot of great resources there. So that might be something else to, um, to look into and to take into account um, when doing that kind of analysis over many years um, for a country in order to um, look at some statistics. So great questions here. Um, I will go ahead and pause now um, to let you all work through the Earth Engine code. We have about 45 minutes left where we will remain online. Um, we'll continue to monitor the Q&A. If, if there are some similar questions coming through, we'll, we'll pop back on and, and um, you mention them and maybe show our screen as needed. Um, we didn't see that much last with the last session, so we didn't come back on. Um, but I'll also be monitoring the Q&A document here um, and seeing what comes up. Um, I believe my colleague might play a little light jazz for you all, so you can, um, you know, uh, mute for a while if you're if you're not interested in hearing that. But um, feel free to continue to answer ask your questions via the Q and A and. We will remain online now for the next 45 minutes or so. All right, everyone. This is Amber just jumping back on here. Um, we didn't notice any common questions um, coming up on the Earth Engine exercises. So hopefully you all work through those nicely. Um, a few reminders before we finish for today's session. Um, we are cataloging all of those questions and the answers in a Q&A document that we'll be posting to the training website. Um, give us a little bit of time to go through those and make sure we've answered everything properly. And we'll post this as a PDF to the training website um, that you can use for reference later on. Um, again, for those of you um, who may not have seen it, the Earth Engine script codes are located within the PowerPoint itself um, for today's presentation. You can go directly to that and um, work through them yourself. Um, we will be sending around a survey. I mentioned this earlier, so we really appreciate your feedback. Um, in particular, in terms of the um, training format, ideas you have for other kinds of formats and um, other types of topics for training or software you'd be interested in us. Um, we are really focused on meeting the needs of our community out there. So we want to hear from you. We want to hear what's working for you, what isn't. Um, over the, the past couple of years, we've gotten a lot of uh, response about the use of Earth Engine. Um, so we've tried to meet that response with a couple of recent trainings in the past two years. Um, and it is a, it is a fantastic resource um, along with many others out there. Um, so thanks again for being with us. Uh, we had hundreds of folks from around the world on, and we're always so grateful for our fantastic um, audience and participation. So um, we hope you enjoyed this webinar series. We will go ahead and close for today. Um, if you have additional questions that aren't answered here or that we didn't discuss today, you can email myself um, or my colleague Juan Torres Perez. Our email addresses are listed here and we'll keep them posted on the Q&A document as well. So um, do take care everyone and we hope to see you with our, our next RSET training series.